I think we all can learn something from him. Maybe not how we cut hair, but... You want to make some decisive cuts on the back. So you, but you can learn to have some confidence in yourself. Don't take yourself too seriously. Show that it doesn't... That you can, you know, own it. That you don't need to pressure... Let yourself be pressured from societal standards too much. I think there are a lot of things we can learn from him. It's not bowl cut maintenance. That's uh, the title of the video. It's like self-esteem maintenance. Welcome back. Welcome back, everybody. I was able to adjust my sleep schedule again. As you can tell, it's a normal time for me again. Uh, however, that also means it's now later in the day for me. I got up at like 6 a.m., starting to feel tired. So uh, let's see how it goes. Nothing special for today. Yeah. Ah, cool. There's one thing I, uh, that happened since last stream, and that is we have a new emote. Uh, it's uh, it's the green bunny from uh, the older live overflow videos. Anyway, uh, one other thing arrived. Uh, I got uh, two more. Um, sorting boxes for all the electronics that I had like in, in, in that just in that pile uh, so now it's pretty cool let me show you I have all these ICs here and I've labeled them all uh, cool right so uh, yeah that's the only thing kind of that happened. The doggy is also with me. He is right now down there. Come here. You want to say hi to stream? You want to say hi to stream? Yeah. Say hello. He really hates us. Yeah. Because usually he has to hang out with me in here. Uh, when his... Um, most favorite human in the world is not home so uh, he has to he has to be with the second favorite human and uh, yeah he doesn't like it did you finish the google ctf what do you mean with finish the google ctf this is like impossible as a single person there's a massive gap between his first and favorite human absolutely I know what you mean with solving it. I say it's impossible as a single person to solve all these challenges. Um, and I'm like, that, that's insane. Don't, don't, don't think that you need to solve all the challenges at the CTF. Like that's not the goal at all. Uh, be happy when you solve one, maybe two challenges if you feel brave. You don't really don't have to deal with more. They are hard enough. Yeah, especially Google CTF, correct. Yeah, that's pretty hardcore. Let's just head... Oh my god. I realize I'm a lot more tired than... Usually. So let's see. Where were we? Uh, last stream was uh, pretty, like, in a, in a middle... Um, in the middle of the night kind of stream, at least for the EU people. So not many people were here. But... We made quite some good progress. Basically, we have finished the uh, RAM module. Um, and so now you can, uh, so we have these dip switches here now. Uh, there we go. These dip switches here to select uh, the address. For example, uh, we can select, so right now it's address zero. Now it's address one, also indicated by these LEDs here, address two, and so forth. So we can select addresses, and we can also see its value that is stored in there. And with this dip switch, we can also set the value that we want to store. So for example, uh, we if we want to now store, so we have like address zero right now here. You can see all are off. Um, and we want to store this value here now in that memory segment, we can now use that button here to do that. I guess this is kind of how I can get it onto the screen. I guess if I remove that for a moment. So 
So let's write this value into that address. Boom. And now these two turned on. So this is written there. Now we can go to the next address and we can like store there another value like that. And let's store that. So now that is stored and now we can like switch back to the first address. Here we have the original value again and here's the second address. So yeah, that's what we finished uh, finished last time. Right, we should also reset wires. And then I guess we can kind of like immediately head in because uh, I think the next video is like troubleshooting the RAM and it's pretty long so I wonder if still something is kind of wrong with it or what, what the deal with it is. And in this video I want to power it up, test it out and uh, basically convince ourselves that it's working right. So we'll power it up and it's on. Um, oh, I think I see what's going on. Okay, looks like we don't have these issues. Ours seems to work uh, fine. So that's kind of that's kind of cool. Boy. Uh, you program it exactly like what I showed you right now. You write the values, your program into RAM with exactly what, what, what I just shown you. You select the address and the value you want to write into RAM and that's how you write your program into RAM. So I'm just looking cl very closely here and what I see, it's writing that. Uh, no, this is not the guy from Computer File. Oh, maybe he was on there on an episode. I, I'm not so sure, but uh, his name is Ben Eater. Uh, there you go. Ben Eater. Kind of set our... Uh... Uh, thanks, Tristan uh, Bedell for the uh, Twitch Prime sub. We have also now a new emote if you want to check it out. A one zero zero zero. Uh, so if we set this enabled there, then on the next clock pulse. Okay, let's try that. Uh, okay, so you can see the address up here. Okay, so this is manual. Uh, so this would be now the input from here, and that this is completely one right now is a little bit weird because. Ah, uh, well, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe it's not weird. Okay, wait, that's an able. Oh, wait, uh, the clock is already running and that was a bit confusing. All right, all right, okay, okay. So uh, input is enabled. Let's uh, change like, for example, like this. Now the address we should read should be 1000 with the next clock pulse. So we can execute one clock by pressing that other button uh, up here. So let's see if we, when we press it, with the next clock cycle, we read that in. Okay, seems to work. We we read the one zero zero zero, and so we can now put that back and put. Now it should be zero zero one zero zero. Yeah, works. Cool. And then we disable that again. Now putting this thing onto the bus when we tell it to, and then. When we okay, so let's see if that's also true for us. Uh, so this is the output, uh, the the bus transceiver. Um, so on command, so this is currently what is like, is the the these show what's the input to this to this. Um, uh, to this chip and now basically based on if we enable or disable it, it should output it or not. And so I also have an LED here. Mm, so and ground is always enabled. So so a positive uh, here, positive line is disabled and now we enable it and now it's outputting. Uh, if we write a zero into that lowest uh, bit there, now it's, uh, as you can see, now it's also zero. Okay, so that works. Now let's, I guess we can uh, quickly basically go through uh, all of this. Uh, let's set the next one also to zero. That also works. Now if you can see all of this, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna just pulse the clock. This is kinda confusing. Most of the chips that are somehow controlled have uh, uh, are enabled on low and high is always disabled. Now down here, based on the gate that we are using, we are ending this together. 
No, wait, that's a NAND. Right, yeah, because we want output zero. Uh, so this control thing is basically later controlled with a high, uh, whatever. Clock here, and we should see this new data go into memory. Now, if you can see all of this, <laughs> uh, I'm gonna just pulse the clock here. Oh, right, the clock pulse, we forgot that. And we should see this new data go into memory. Okay, clock, pulse, and no, this button should doesn't matter. It should only be the clock. Okay, why is this not working? Okay, let's quickly measure if the control, like the right, the yellow right, wait. Um, we also need to, this has to be disabled. Okay, that's fine. Output, yeah. Oh, wait, wait. I need to go on to run mode. Now it should work. Yes. Okay, now that worked. Okay, so basically uh, the, the problem uh, that I just had was that, that um, with here, you can switch between manually inputting stuff, then we have the red LED, or the computer is running and it will output its own stuff through the bus. That's why where the green wires we added here were. So this is simulating the, what the computer, the CPU would input itself. And so I wasn't, I was not on green. I was still wasn't red on the manual mode, but we needed to go to the to the other mode. So that also seems uh, great. Uh, let me just check the other two bits up there if they are also. Uh, let's set. So here I'm holding the next bit, and theoretically, this this one should now turn into a zero, and this should one into a one, I think. Yep. And now the last bit, basically the same. Okay. So. All of these are also in the correct order. So this looks all really good. Oh, uh, cool. Um, Mokiros also wrote something in, in chat. See, see, see the uh, pay to win feature that I've also added? I changed the cheer uh, badge that you get when you cheered, like when you paid money. And now it's like a red bar that is slowly filling up. The more you cheer, the fuller it gets. <laughs> 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 at least with each bracket that uh, Twitch allows, so it gets quite expensive to make it fill up a bit more. <laughs> and so if we want to know the time it takes for this to charge, we just multiply these together. But first we've got to get it into, into standard units. So 0 0.01 microfarads in standard units, which would be farads. And if we multiply these two together, basically we're just moving the decimal point over three here. And that'll be the time that it takes for the capacitor to charge. So basically, uh, the the write signal here that, that ends up uh, going to the 74LS 189s, our, our actual RAM chips, it should write that value in here. Uh, we'll just change this 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 bit here to high. And so on that clock signal, you see it goes high. It doesn't matter how long that clock signal is, it's the first 10 microseconds that clocks in that value. So now we have a little bit of an edge detector uh, here as well. So a, a binary to decimal converter. Cool. Ah, I tried. I wanted to pause before it goes to the next video. All right. Okay. So how much? 0 0.01 microfarad. Okay. So we got that, and I have a 1K resistor here as well. And so uh, I kind of want to look at this with the oscilloscope in a second uh, too. I think that would be kind of cool to look at. And damn you, Ben! I measured the length of all these wires here. And now you move them over one, now everything is kind of screwed up. We move the clock signal over here now. Now it's all crooked. Ben, why did you do that? How is this allowed on Twitch? This is uh, TOS. Um, um, uh, so far we, ha we are still at zero wires, so we are not breaking the TOS right now. Disable reading so they can output. Ah, now it works. Okay, correct. Okay, yeah. So 
So that seems super. Okay, so I want to quickly look at that uh, rising and falling edge immediately again with the oscilloscope. I think that would be kind of cool. Uh, wait, I need to plug in the other plug. I mean, if you are not careful with the capacitors, then uh, maybe, you know, maybe it would be a, a little bean. So I would say let's connect one to the regular, just the clock cycle itself and uh, the output. So, so it's waiting. Uh, let's switch here. Let's increase the clock speed. Channel two enable. There we go. Okay, wow. Well. There's a lot of noise on that signal there. Whatever. If we zoom in, so so the blue one is blue one is the regular clock right now. So if we zoom out we can see that the clock is currently running with 10 Hertz. So the blinking you see there is 10 Hertz. And now if we zoom in and look at the yellow one, uh, we want to trigger on, wow, are we not triggering on, wait, what is going on with the trigger? Aren't you supposed to trigger on the rising edge of Oh, the trigger was in a very weird place. There we go. Okay. As you can see, like blue stays high for a long time. That's a clock signal. But uh, the actual, like the edge detection basically is just the short pause uh, here at the start and immediately drops down again. You basically cannot even see the this edge anymore if you zoom out enough to see the this individual clock cycle so it's it creates a really short pulse cool can you see how f long this pulse is so right now the time division is 20 uh, microseconds so each box here can you see this uh, kind of so so it's basically like 20 microseconds long so I think we should I guess we should now build the uh, instruction register, right? Ben already has it. Uh, we don't have it yet. Before we move on, uh, we should, I guess, catch up with where he's at. Uh, so I guess we uh, could do that. And to do that, we need at least a thread here. So we remove that one, remove that side here. All right. Am I a complete idiot? Why did I do that? There was already a, bre a breadboard. Time to end the stream. <laughs> Somebody said it's slightly different, but uh, what is different? I guess ah, uh, here is something going to ground. Okay, it's very similar, but a little bit different. Uh, sorry, um, looking on the website, this is the instruct the schematic for the instruction register. Uh, when you are done with the project, uh, are you going to print it onto a circuit board? That's one of the things that we could do, but uh, it might be a fun project, but I don't know yet. D don't plan so far ahead. We go with the flow, whatever seems fun. So we want um, a 245 and 2173. <coughs> oh no. I just realized I didn't take my allergy pills today. Uh, 245, 173, uh, we need instruction register is explained in that video. Did, did I miss that video or? 
And how did I how did I miss this? Did we just like I don't know, ignore that? Thanks, uh, more though. Okay, awesome. So let's build that. I guess we can use uh, one here. These are the register that we have built, haven't used in a while as kind of like a reference. Oh, oscilloscope is gone. Uh, yeah, we uh, we are done with the uh, with the oscilloscope part. You clicked for the scope. Oh, well, here, here, look at it. Tell me when when you've seen enough scope. And then we need just wires, but blue is running very low, so we need uh, to open here the second pack. And I guess we do it in the same color actually as these ones here. So we might also want the green one here. And then we, I guess we need all colors oh, for clock and everything. That's enough. <laughs> Glad uh, I, could, I could satisfy you. Okay, so I have to say, I sorted everything now, right? So it was super easy to find these parts. And somehow I feel like I found them too fast. I feel like there was something about just digging in a pile in a box where you dumped everything in and it takes time. It stretches everything longer. It creates content for the stream. And now that everything is sorted, I just find it and now I'm left with, well, crap. Now I don't know what else like to fill time with. How much did this cost? Uh, did what cost? Yeah, I spent actually a lot more than this uh, since since I started uh, because um, I did another order. We tested out different LEDs. We tested out different buttons. We tested out different uh, potentiometers. Uh, so that cost more. Um, I I bought a few parts more often. Um, I had to get more of these wires because they were running low. So I spent a bit more than that. Um, yeah. And then also, if you would start from zero without any equipment, you would also need to buy multimeter and um, maybe a power source even. So uh, it kind of adds all up. It's just painted plastic. You should talk to some Lego fans. They would be more happy if they get more painted Lego parts instead of stickers. I doubt that you can uh, print nice uh, ones with the 3D printer and I would actually doubt that that would be really cost efficient. So first of all, I think they would be so low quality, they would kind of suck to build with. And second of all, they, uh, they would probably be not as cost efficient as you imagine it to be. Yeah, I don't know, what does a good 3D, 3D printer cost? By the way, does anybody, is anybody of you into 3D printers and can recommend me a lazy one? You know, like one that I don't need to maintain and it's not necessarily on the price, just like a thing that kind of works when I need it to work. By the way, I also wanted to replace uh, the uh, this LED up here this LED tells us uh, what mode we are in. If it's like our hand uh, selection clock. So right now it's like the, the, the regular one and then we can switch. Now it's our hand clock. And so I feel like we should at, um, put that color here the same as here, this one here. Because here we said um, red is our like from hand mode while green is it's autumn it's all running uh, and it kind of like turned on basically so so I feel like I want to turn that I guess I guess it's on when it's in running mode so I feel like I want to replace it with a green LED just so that I don't know you can print scale Lego pieces who wants to play with Duplo I want to play Lego and by the way, it's just a matter of time until I spend money on a very expensive Lego piece and we build it on stream. I kind of want to buy that uh, Luna module. That's kind of cool. And it's actually not that expensive either. A lot of 3D printers are clones of the Prusa. Yeah, but was Prusa like the original kind of thing that, that you could build yourself, basically? Uh, I'm not so sure.
I'm not necessarily looking for the cheapest offer. I'm looking for a reliable thing that, that's not like, okay, not, not, not killing my bank. I guess my budget is under a thousand, I think, for a 3D print. I feel like under a thousand I would be, I would be okay. I guess that's my budget. Like $300 seems so cheap that I feel like that sounds more like that breaks easily. I, I would be more inclined, for example, to buy this one here just because I feel like, or I would hope that this holds up a bit better. What are these ones? SL1. Why are they in a glass shield like that? Do they work like with lasers or something? UV LED. Oh, yeah, okay. Is that like with like a bath? Thin layers of resin. Oh, that's kind of... Isn't that cool? Is that isn't that not cooler as a three D printer? Does anybody like really uh, know? Is that is 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 that not cooler if you build like with resin? Can that not make uh, cooler stuff? Buying machinery with no intention of maintaining it. Yes, and that and that's what I hope. I pay a little bit more, and then it then I don't need to maintain it. <laughs> resin gets a lot finer details, but it's not, yeah, that's what I imagine. Pay someone to maintain it for you. See, the problem is there's the word someone in there, which means another person, and I don't like to deal with people. Resin is nasty and brittle. Yeah, I guess this is with the bath, right? Like you need to somehow clean that or deal with those fluids and and those chemicals. I guess it requires some kind of maintenance from that sense. Most people don't want to maintain their car either, true. And luckily, there are just a lot of shops you just roll in and give them money and they do stuff. I, I don't think this exists for 3D printers. It's toxic, you have to wear clothes. Yeah, okay, that sounds that sounds kind of annoying. I mean, I don't even know what I would do with a 3D printer. I have absolutely zero use for it. It would really just be... It's kind of... It, it would just fulfill my dream of building... Of b getting like a home lab with all the different equipments, like a hacker space in your home and you don't use any of the tools, but you just want to have them around you. That's kind of the deal for me. Can't wait for 3D printers that run on water. You mean like like a mill, like you have a water wheel and that generates power for the printing? Yeah, and then you could also just like online order your 3D prints. If you use it that rarely, then uh, it also doesn't make sense to have it yourself. True, and then also you could probably get super nice quality prints. A week ago, you needed a phone holder instead of buying on Amazon when you print one. See, there I would be lazier. I would just buy it on Amazon and it would be there the next day. Before that, I would might even check Amazon Prime now and see if, if there's a, a, an okay one available Amazon right now and then they would deliver it in a couple of like two hours or so. As soon as you have an oscilloscope, you will find use for it. Exactly, you buy it like buy it and then you use it like four times and then you don't use it for two years. Amazon will deliver faster and the printer will print the part. Yeah, I think so too. I would print stuff for your crazy camera rig, but that's the thing, a camera rig needs to always hold stuff and that, that stuff is not like strong and rigid enough. Like all these little things I have there need to hold quite a lot. Yeah, a CNC machine would be cool. Like a laser cutter would be also cool. What DSLR do you have? I have one DSLR. This is here a Canon 80D and then I have a mirrorless uh, Sony a7 III over there. But I'm a, I am I have no clue about cameras. I just bought this camera. Well, first I bought this camera because I want to use it for streaming. Uh, but the Canon suck for continuous video stuff. Uh, so, so the so the screen you see at the top up there, uh, that is from the Canon here, with a macro lens, and it looks nice, but it's like connected via USB, and you need like a software to get that, and it's kind of it kind of sucks. And so I looked around what other streamers are using, and I saw slightly musical who has like an awesome setup and he uses the a7 III and so I bought the a7 III and that one is cool. And now I'm contemplating to buy another one for the top down shot because like this Logitech, you know, the, the standard Logitech web 
webcam just doesn't look so nice. And it would also be cool to have like a, a zoom lens to then like zoom in a little bit. That would be kind of cool, I think. Yeah, I mean, I really don't use it to its potential. It, it kind of feels bad that I paid that much money for it. It's, it's, li it's literally just a glorified webcam at this point. I set it up once, I don't know how to use it. Yeah, but it looks nice. I think it looks really nice. Like I think that I think that image looks really good. Is it cold in Germany? Uh, why are you wearing a hoodie? Uh, it's cold in here because I have an AC. <laughs> and then also like I mean the Canon kind of sucks with the connection as I said, but the Canon also looks like like these macro shots. Doesn't doesn't this look awesome? Uh, Mr. One Dev, how can you code this computer? Uh, you literally write by hand. Here you can select the address you want to write the value to, and here you can select the value you want to write to, and then you write uh, your program instruction by instruction into the RAM, and then you let it execute. The second reason why I'm wearing a hoodie is because I was shopping yesterday, and I bought that yellow hoodie. <laughs> oh fuck, what is streaming doing to me? You have been considering buying an ASM3, but they are so much. Yeah, they are really expensive. That's why I'm also not sure about buying a second one because do I really need that overhead shot? Like, I, I don't make any money. Like, I, I make basic. The money I make from YouTube and Twitch does not justify spending that money on a camera. That's why I probably shouldn't. It's 28 degrees in here, so. It's colder outside. Wait, let me open my window. So now you're running your AC while having the window open. Uh, that is actually correct. Let me turn that AC off. Can you use an Arduino with it or is that cheating? It's kind of cheating, obviously. Depends on what you use the Arduino for. For example, for programming the program with an Arduino, that, I think that's fair because otherwise you would put it in by hand to let the Arduino do that for you. How does CPU differentiate instructions from just raw data? That's a really good question. Uh, let's wait with answering that when the computer is set up more. Uh, because I think it will, s questions, these, this is the kind of questions I ask myself also when I was younger. Like how does a CPU, it's all zeros and ones, but why are some zeros and ones mean it's doing something and some it's not like, what, what, what is the meaning behind it? That would be a cool, that's something cool to explore, I guess. And yeah, Morozil, that's a good answer. It doesn't, that's how buffer overflows work. <laughs> At least on our architecture that we are having, that we have on our, like the typical Intel CPU, x86 CPUs that we are running, uh, data and code is uh, shared. There's no diff, it's not living in different areas. We have one RAM and that RAM will contain code, but it will also contain just other stuff that we want to use the RAM for. And if we are not careful, we might have a bug and suddenly it tries to execute the data in our RAM, which we didn't intend to be instructions. And that's what you basically do with like the old school buffer overflows with shell code and the A73. And I mean, like on modern CPUs and modern, pr modern programs, we do separate data and code more. Uh, modern CPUs uh, support uh, the, this concept of different memory areas that are uh, only, that, that are not executable and areas that are specifically executable but not writable. Uh, that's kind of a mitigation against like these old school buffer overflows. But so then you have kind of a separation. Then you have memory areas that are dedicated for executing code and you can't modify it. And you have areas that are dedicated for data and you could never execute them. So if you would set your uh, instruction pointer to such an address, uh, then the CPU would uh, uh, probably get a sec fault uh, because it would see that oh wait this instruct uh, this address is in an in a memory area that is marked as not executable so i refuse to execute it modern 64 bit cpus work the same way as this 8 bit uh you need to be more specific because the answer is 
a clearly a no, but also clearly a yes. That's the thing what Isar Eagle is saying. Principally, yes. Like, you have different registers, you have a clock, you have memory that is somehow accessed, you have an instruction decoder, you have an ALU, like all these principles, these concepts are somewhat the same, but obviously modern CPUs have way more crazy features. Really, really crazy how it's implemented, pipelining and, and, and a lot of fancy stuff. And by that sense, it's like not even comparable to, to this computer. But on an abstract level, they are still the same. You need so you need to learn something like this by doing. Like you can't. The, you, you, I mean, in theory, you could just read the Intel x86 manual, right? You could just read this document here. It's 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 just a 25 megabyte uh, PDF. It only has. It only has 4,900 pages. I guess, wait, that's that's unfair. That's the, um, that's just the reference here at the end. So it only has like, I don't know, what, what is that? 4,800 pages that you could read about all the various um, instructions. Yeah, so you could theoretically read that, but that doesn't make any sense. You could maybe read the beginning here where it talks a bit more generally about the uh, about the architecture, some some kind of like, like kind of a little bit how how stuff works, but this is a reference manual. You just don't read that stuff. Like you you learn that by doing. Like you want to write shell code, and now you want to understand. Hey, what does this instruction do? And then you look up. Okay, what does what is syscall actually for an instruction? How else this cause implemented it? And then you uh, like here you go to that to that thing, and then you see ah okay a syscall is opcode zero f zero five. It does a fast call to privilege level, whatever that means. Um, it's sixty four bit mode, um, and then and then then there's a description invokes an operating system system call at privilege level zero. It does so by loading RIP from this MSR register um, and, and all that kind of stuff, right? And then, and, and now you learned about it. Reading all of this is worth to put on your resume. Uh, I feel like nobody would hire you. They would think you're insane. The bad thing about x86 is that they added way too many instructions that nobody uses like what like what are these kind of instructions you're talking about and all instructions use power what, what do you mean by that yeah i heard that they don't that microsoft doesn't uh keep a a compatible syscall layer they want you to use the wrappers which is fine doesn't really matter does it but all have an instruction set pointer and counter. I don't know what, I don't understand your question. Some people just really love to read though. Yeah, sure. But then you just keep it secret, you know? It's like reading Fifty Shades of Grey. You don't tell anybody about it. You just, you know, you do that alone at home in a dark room. Uh, okay, next cables. So the 245, we connect a0 to A3 to ground. So A A1, wait, this starts at A1. So pin 2, 3, 4, and 5. Okay. We connect that to ground. When I was uh when I was in my bachelor's and I was working at a company like doing internship. Uh, my mentor there uh, told me about his colleague that they went, they went to like some kind of like conference, you know, developer conference, and and they do like real low level implementation. So so they worked on like firmware and also uh, kernel hypervisor stuff for like the mainframes and things like that. So so really really extremely low level programming, and so they 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 know their way around like the CPUs and 
the architecture. And then they were at this conference and there was this programming competition where they had to like sp speed up a piece of code. They had to make it fast and it was like some kind of matrix multiplication or so. And uh, th the, the team that could run the fastest program, uh, they, uh, they, they would win like a, like a laptop or something. And so, so it was like a booth or like part of, it was just a small comp uh, challenge at, at the conference, I guess. And my mentor told me that um, his colleague won it not because he optimized the algorithm like everybody was doing. He just knew the CPU better and he and the caching and how it all works. So he just rearranged the data, basically like flipped the matrix, like uh, just transposed the matrix, uh, basically rotated it by 90 degrees and then did all just the, the, the algorithm that was already there. And that, uh, and that just killed um, was faster than anybody else and and I was super baffled how anybody could like know so much about CPUs that they would like understand that they if they just handle the data slightly differently that their code would be their code that has to rely a lot on like you know, dealing with data would be so much faster I don't know if I got the details right at this point, it's like he told me that he told he told somebody. The clock runs into every gate, and what really uses power is fast switching of the gates. Unless you disconnect the hardware for these instructions, they use power. Every hardware implementation of the instruction. I don't know much about CPUs, but I would say that's not true. Don't like modern CPUs only consume they use like CMOS or whatever, and then so they only consume power when they are switching. So the circuit parts that are not used are basically not consuming any power. And on top of that, the CPU manufacturer, especially on for the mobile CPUs, they have a like, huge investment into making it power efficient. Otherwise, th they couldn't be competitive. So they probably do like crazy stuff about disabling certain areas of the CPU when they are not used as much as possible and I don't know what. And I guess then there's also the whole microcode stuff. Yeah, I, I have no I have no damn clue. It's also a thing like, you know, as a as a CPU manufacturer, you don't really know what exactly will be used later, right? You have an idea for new instructions that could maybe solve like a nice problem and you, you implement them and then practically it turns out to not be that relevant or not relevant anymore or whatever. So of course, like some instructions are kind of like bad choices. It's like any product you bring on the market. Uh, some products just really help and others don't, I don't know. They do clock gating first to just prevent it from switching, then power gating of certain areas to turn them to turn them completely. Turning stuff back on takes longer, so they transition into a higher sleep state only if you deem it necessary. Uh, yeah, I know there's some crazy stuff going on. All of that on different areas on the chip. What music music do you enjoy? Uh, I don't have a particular. Um, it depends on my mood. Okay, so now we just need to make sure this side, oh uh, wait, which one did Ben either connect to ground? Yeah, I'm an idiot. Not these, this chip has the stuff pulled to ground. That's the two, four, five. There we go, okay. And then the next four, where does Ben connect these? Then connects. We need a doggo as a sub remote. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, I need to. I'm not sure how how I would make that though. I don't know. Maybe I should just try. Yeah, it's funny that you say metal. Metal is probably the like the one one of the genres that I just have a really hard time to get into. Of course, there are a couple of metal songs I really like too, but. That is probably one of the genres I like the least amount of stuff from. <laughs> Metal is your life. Yeah, I mean, 
I find it so fascinating, right? Like I know how passionate people, but I mean, it goes with a lot of different things, but it also happens in particular with, for example, music that people are so passionate about certain, uh, certain genres. And I just like, I know that they love it, but I cannot even really understand what, what's, what they're like about it. But generally music also doesn't play a huge role in my life. Like I said, it always depends on the mood, what I listen to. Uh, so, so you would have to ask me like in, in that situation, what would you like to listen to that? That's more something I guess I could have an answer on symphonic metal. I enjoy the way the instrument sounds, but screaming is something. Yeah. So that's also, I guess, something I could relate to like the, the, the loud, like the aggressive screaming was, I, I guess I, I can see why people like it. It's might be very, I don't know, in some way, stress relieving, I guess, or, or, you know, it pumps you up. But to me, it never had that kind of, I never had that kind of feeling or response to it. I know, but I do really like melody. So, so I, so the metal songs I do like are also, I guess, more melodic. I don't know. Screaming is the best part. It, it feels like such an acquired taste. I feel like, I feel like there is something about the screaming and metal that I just cannot appreciate because I don't know, I, I haven't acquired the taste yet and my life would be better if I would, you know, uh, if I would develop that taste, does it make sense somehow? I, 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 every time when I hear people talking about metal, I or also classical music is the other genre I, I listen not really to, but it's also the one that I have a hard time getting into. But I feel like I'm missing out on something. Oh, it's loading. Uh, thanks for the for the raid. How was your stream today? You know, one day, one day I will stream before you and I will be able to host the all raid you. <laughs> I feel, I feel so leeching of you. You should, you should host or raid some other people sometime. Uh, I have a computer, applied computer science degree, a, a bachelor's. <laughs> Wire speed police here. Yeah, yeah. Um, I need to be careful with the terms of service. I had to adjust my sleep schedule, so I stayed up as long as I could yesterday, which was basically 8 p.m. And then I went to bed, and so I got up really early this morning, because obviously I can't like sleep 12 hours. So it's like getting pretty late for me. Uh, I never said I wasn't in super bed. What? What? What are you saying? Uses instructions, the Intel architecture list, eight different length knob instructions. I would, my first reaction to that is, I don't know, but I would guess that that has absolute, so either it has use for aligning code and getting like, kind of like instruction fetching and caching and, and all that stuff optimized. Uh, if So it's something that the compiler might use to optimize stuff, I could imagine, or, they kind of come for free because the instruction decoder in, in a way like just works like that uh, in a way how it's implemented. So, you know, maybe maybe there are two bits in an, I don't know the opcode format exactly, but I could imagine that maybe two bits kind of decide the length of the in, uh, instruction that is coming. And so if, if it's then a knob and these bits decide how long it is, you know, it's the same way. Do you count every single, every possible move instruction with all the possible addresses that are possible? Are these all individual instructions or not? Clearly not. It's like one move instruct. I mean, there are, I guess multiple variants of it, but let's say there's move and in, in an address. You know, like it's it's just a move instruction and the address is variable. So maybe, you know, I don't know. I I wouldn't say that they are useless. I would assume an exchange on EIX, EIX doesn't throw away any high bits. It would just exchange EIX, I believe. But yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Could There could be weird stuff like that involved too. You know, the crazy thing I just thought of, two years ago I found your YouTube channel and now two years later and I just over a month I will get my first account. Oh, that's awesome. 
Congrats. RX is AX plus nine. Yeah, I, I understand that they are part of each other, but the thing is a lot of the instructions that just operate on AIX just operate on the AIX part and they just leave the remain the whole RAX, you know, just leave it be. They don't do anything to it. But I mean, maybe that particular instruction has an effect. I don't know. I might also need a Michael Sarah uh, emote. That might also make sense. Maybe I should do a Michael Sarah emote. What's the most common vulnerability you find when doing pen testing? So I do mostly code audits on web applications. So obviously the most stuff I see is web application issues. And the most stuff I see there, I don't do statistics on it, so I'm not so sure. Probably like XSS, I guess, or CSRF, I guess some, some, some stuff about that. Or maybe just some logical stuff. Do you think the metric what kind of vulnerabilities happen the most uh, is a useful metric and if if it's useful for what is it useful i feel like it's mostly unnecessary to talk about i think it only makes sense in the context of mitigations because uh, if a certain mitigations can squash a couple of different bug classes that happen a lot then that makes sense but anything besides that i feel like how often a certain vulnerability kind of occurs is completely meaningless. The social account in the background, it's called La Metric. It's just like an, an overpriced uh, LED display. Hey, oh, by the way, we talked about it on a stream. I forgot to mention. Uh, we talked about this La Metric, how it's like overpriced and that there are no competing products and that's why it's so expensive. But I did find on Amazon, I stumbled over because we talked about it and obviously uh, Google is always listening and then it displays different Amazon stuff suddenly for me. I found these products here uh, from Divoom or so. They are just 40 euros. They are like 16 by 16 uh, LED displays and they look also, they look like kind of the same LEDs. I don't know how they look in person if they also look as sleek. But I figured I could, uh, I would, I should maybe buy one and check it out. That's like, you could get a couple of them for the price of one Lametric, so kind of cool. $200 doesn't feel worth it. <laughs> yeah. We talked about this on stream before. Yes, it's expensive. You have to consider this product. It was a Kickstarter. You know, it's a small company that made that. Uh, if you consider how many they like, it's it's like not a a China mass-produced kind of product that that benefits from you know being a mass consumer product. It's it looks pretty sleek. It has a nice software. It has like apps. It has some features to it. It's just you know I I feel like if if you really break down the cost and think about all the people you have to pay for your small company and I, I don't know, it, it doesn't feel like so crazy, to be honest. In comparison to other consumer products, what you can get for 200 euros, you can get like, you know, an almost a, a good, a nice smartphone for that price. Um, that obviously seems crazy, but you just can't compare these things. This is just like different consumer levels. They knew YouTubers would buy them, they priced at the time. I don't think that that was the I don't think that they were thinking YouTubers buy them. You also have to think how how few YouTubers they are. If you price for YouTubers, like that is like I don't know. That seems like I don't know. Doesn't seem to be the smartest strategy. <clears throat> strategy. In my opinion, many things just seem overpriced because we see mass fabricated devices everywhere. Yep, exactly. I also think the same with like, uh, for example, s services that people provide, like hairdresser right like it's a rush to the bottom that we pay like extremely little to like hairdressers we want to get like um, a man haircut for like 10 euros and so we expect to be able in these 10 euros included it's not only the half hour that it takes to cut your hair but the price of the the whole place the tools and the times where there are no customers and 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 you think like 10 euros is a sustainable like kind of it's insane and even 20 euro like 
for example, so so I hate going to the hairdresser. So I always try to find somebody who comes to me, <laughs> uh, who makes like home visits for haircuts. And of course, these services exist. For example, a lot of elderly people they just can't go outside anymore, so a hairdresser comes to them. Uh, and and so these services exist, especially in in Berlin. There there seems quite a lot like that, or I guess more often maybe I don't know. And so they told me like it cost like my haircut would be twenty five euros. And that person has to write half an hour to me, bring all the tools that they have, the taxes they need to pay, uh, the, the time that it costs, and then again half an hour home. And then, of course, they don't have perfectly scheduled clients. Uh, they can't like do a lot of work. And I feel, I, f I feel like 20 euros is so underpriced. So I gave them 40. I mean, you can pay easily 200 for 50 for a haircut if you use expensive colors and it, if it takes longer, if you have to sit there and occupy that, that chair and the space uh, in, in a place by, by a professional. Yeah, of course, easy 250. I feel like being a freelancer made me really appreciate the time that people like work for and, and put into. How much, how, what's kind of, wh how much does two euros like kind of get you? Uh, like, is, is that a, f is that, I mean, first of all, I think it's absolutely ridiculous that with globalization, we have like cases where, you know, a smartphone still costs 200 or 500 euros for you, but it's normal that a person for a haircut only earns two euros, like, you know, crappy world. But disregarding that, uh, does does like two euro get you far with like normal life with like paying for an apartment and and that stuff your yearly rent is 510 euros my yearly rent is I mean, I don't know how you if you calculate utilities in or not. It's like roughly like I guess 10,000 euros <laughs> Anyone who cuts their own hair is crazy even if you are just like make yourself a What's it called? A clean shave? Is that even then crazy? Do you know this video here? What is this? Let's do a reaction stream. Whoa, it's the illusion. Reporting from somewhere on Spaceship Earth. It's time to teach him how to keep your bowl cut tight because my hair is getting a little long. So you need a pair of, you need a brush? We're gonna get into it here. First thing, super simple. You gotta brush it all out, man. You gotta get it all brushed. It's a no hesitation move, the straight across. Just wham, that's it. Look at that, man, look at that. Right across the deal. Oh, rusty scissors kinda suck, but whatever. And then we just go. There are no mistakes in the world of bowl cuts. And you just- i leave you with this amazing tutorial for a second because I gotta refill my drink. Bring it right on back, man. You gotta go a little blind. It's okay. Just you all you want to hear is that hacking sound. Now remember, you're trying not to poke your eye out. Oh, look at that. I got some hair back there, right? So I got this mirror in back so I can kind of see what's going on, but it gets a little tricky. I think we all can learn something from him. Maybe not how we cut hair, but you want to make some decisive cuts on the back so you, you can learn to have some confidence in yourself, don't take yourself too seriously, show that it doesn't, that you can, you know, own it, that you don't need to pressure, let yourself be pressured from societal standards too much. I think there are a lot of things we can learn from him. It's not bowl cut maintenance, that's uh, the title of the video. It's like self-esteem maintenance. Why are you frustrated? Yeah, but he is not in school anymore, and and school is brutal. School is unfair. Okay. Anyway, let's continue. Uh, I guess blue wires now for up there. Now that I'm more and more an established YouTuber, it's just a matter of time until I will color my hair. We have this cool. We have this cool YouTuber in Germany. Moin, servus, moin. Ich grüße euch recht herzlich zum neuen Video. Ich möchte euch heute meine neue Frisur vorstellen 
Und wie das dazu gekommen ist, erzähle ich euch gleich. Aber guckt erstmal so und so. Das hat auf jeden Fall was. Again, another guy you can really learn something from. That kind of self-esteem. How did I just cut this so wrong? Wait, what? I personally always think academia really helps. I personally like university, but uh, I mean, especially in our industry, a lot of people also make it work without any degree. Uh, I don't think that in an Ausbildung you particularly learn a lot about that stuff. Uh, you would only do it to have basically that degree uh, to, yeah, it would just be a way to like show somebody that you have some knowledge, I guess, with that degree, I, I don't know. I guess just based on statistics, it's always better to have the higher degree, the higher, the more likely it is to get like better paying jobs and all that stuff in terms of statistics. But that all breaks down when you go onto the individual level, you know, maybe for you individually, it makes no sense maybe you just don't want to go to university maybe your job doesn't require university maybe you know there are many reasons why maybe you want to do an Ausbildung that makes sense for you personally yeah and I agree what cause against humanity is saying at least if I would hire somebody that's basically what you know what I would be looking out for however there's one thing about Germany that Germany is pretty conservative when it comes to that stuff in the workplace. They love their papers. So uh, I st I, I'm not sure, but I've, and it definitely depends on the company, but it generally I feel like that even in IT, Germany is probably a bit more looking out on, on the degrees. Like I, I know a lot of jobs where just based on the degree you have, you would just earn more. It doesn't matter what you, like if you do the same job, just because you come in with a higher degree, you are in a higher earning bracket. Just, just like that, just company policy. You took a year off after school and I'm worried now that nobody will hire me. Play some CTF, write a few write-ups on a blog, fill up that blog like with a couple of write-ups and then tell them you did a year off, you uh, played CTF to kind of like study more and here's the blog to show for, solved. It doesn't, it, this doesn't have to be hard challenges, just something, you know. An employee will not look deeply into the challenges that you have solved. If, if they see, oh my gosh, this person has published stuff on, in, on a personal blog, that, that already looks so good, I, I, I think. Are well, your exam is on the 19th of July. You got enough time. You, you can start studying on like the 18th or so. Do you have the exam with like the always on camera? Are you in that kind of like thing now where you can't do it naked? You can't do it naked, it's just weird, yeah. It's a lessons of confidence, I, I tell you. You should just own it. You probably automatically pass if you do. Uh, I do have OSCP, but um I only have that because my employee paid for a certification and so I, I chose to do that one. Uh, otherwise, I don't have any certifications. Also, have you heard about the recent drama with the, was it with the Cyber Mentor on YouTube and, OS, and OSCP or the people behind OSCP? God damn it. Really sad. Really annoying. They rectified it together. Yeah. But it has been apparently a problem for like a long time or now that they go against uh, criticism. And so I guess in this case, uh, it was good that the Cyber Mentor has so well, so good connections basically and has such an influence. Uh, you know, this, this kind of issue is not the first time that it happened. And I'm not sure if the other cases were also rectified because they generally that's something that they do. They just feared now, I guess, more uh, backlash than in other cases, I, I guess. 
So, you know, to me that still feels not rectified at all. I didn't think this stuff would pop out on my recommend since, you mean the Twitch channel? That's cool. Like what, what are you up to usually? Do you, like what kind of streams are you watching? And do you have any kind of tech background or are you like really just like completely like stumbled into something completely weird? Oh, you have a tech background, nice. Are you then also watching like science and technology like other, uh, other programmers on Twitch or are you on Twitch just for general entertainment, like some gaming or just chatting or so? <laughs> you want to watch Unreal Tournament streams. I just do general entertainment, but I usually didn't come on Twitch much until recently. Nice. So, so what are what what kind of streams are you generally following? Are are you following particular people, or are you just always kind of like stumbling on the platform and clicking on something? Oh, links. Uh, if you grew up on Counter Strike, have you ever played the Counter Strike Surf maps? Was that a thing for you? Do you know? that the guy who invented surf maps is also streaming uh, a lot on Twitch nowadays. He is, he's, in, he's incredibly nice. He is such a nice dude. He's pretty small also. He has always like, just like, I don't know, a couple of dozen views. I, I wasn't really a counter striker, but um, we, I, we, we did LAN parties when, obviously when we were younger and counter strike one, 1. 1.6 uh, was, um, obviously a huge thing and um yeah this dude i'm the guy who invented surf maps i originally made them in cs16 and so uh here this video you need to watch if if you are into counter strike if counter strike was kind of like a little bit of your uh, childhood then this is the video you need to watch uh it's called the story of surf with mario Because of uh, that video, he basically started streaming and he got like for like two days, he was incredibly popular, but now he's like a very small streamer, but he's so nice. He's so nice. I hosted him the other day. Yeah, I also played a lot of KZ maps. I think he's probably the nicest person I've ever encountered on, on Twitch. When you, when you see him streaming, you know why he's like, so, but yeah, that, that video is really cool. And he just like, is uh, streaming building surf maps and uh, and also sometimes playing them. Without Counter Strike, your life would be very different. Yeah. Okay, and now I think we just need to add the LEDs, and then it looks. Oh no, we need to. Oh, we need to pack this a bit tighter. We need the control wires up there as well. Um, when I do long wires like that, I can usually get two on the same column. I actually have two on the same column. So these two are on the same row. These two are on the same row. These two are on the same and these two are on the same. They are one, two, three, four. We have four rows here and those are eight wires. Those are two in a row, but we even need to pack them tighter. Are you planning to get hands on a, a Raspberry Pi 4? Uh, I don't really know what to do with it, so I have no plans currently. I mean, if I would have a plan with it, I would get one, but I don't know. I don't know what I would do with it. Yeah, yeah, I said I ordered on Reichelt and on Mauser, but it obviously depends where you're from. Are you from Germany is the question, because otherwise it doesn't make sense. It's two individual desks just put as like this, you know. Just the basic desk. Is, I think it's like each, it's, it's 170 long, one meter and 70 centimeters, I believe. It's like, yeah, it's like my arm length like this. Uh, and they are in that configuration, but it's like a, it's like a movable desk. Uh oh, this is scary. <gasps> Do you see that? It's too scary to do right now because I did so much on the setup on this desk that I don't know what I would break if I would now fully. So the second is the clear. Ah, we connect the clear to and the G and G1. Any like English speaking person in the US was able to trick their parents into thinking I become a CS pro and the parents were thinking, oh my gosh, our kid is into computer science, but then he went off and played 
ESL. Oh no, my kid is into computer science. He's a nerd. Please play Counter Strike like all the cool kids in school, please. Want to finish this uh, instruction register module, and that will probably be it. I will have to set up notifications for this. I mean, yeah, you can just follow on uh, for on Twitch, and, and and then you should get notifications. By the way, there's also uh, another uh, guy who is uh, streaming, uh, like building kind of like a, a startup, a startup on on Twitch as well. And it's called notify.me. So he's building that on stream as well. His name is Jamie, I think. Jamie Pine on Twitch. Oh, he's currently streaming. All right. Yeah. And so that's basically a platform where you can, like, subs you basically subscribe on Notify Me and you get uh, all the notifications for all the different uh, kind of platforms. So so here, see, I'm I'm live right now. I have eight subscribers on here. Yeah, I know. So he's building that on stream, so it's kind of cool. Might be a useful uh, site if you kind of want to get notified. You ever thinking about leaving YouTube? No, YouTube is a great platform. I don't intend to leave. Uh, however, obviously, I want to diversify because it's not a secure, it's not a safe platform. Uh, it, you know, like the 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 content I'm creating. Uh, has the potential of being seen too risky uh, because you know it can easily be misinterpreted as like malicious hacking stuff and so while so far I don't so so far my experience with Google and YouTube has been great I have no reason to believe that like I would ever have issues I guess it's generally a good idea not to have all your stuff in one platform because just like if something happens, then it would be good if you have multiple kind of different ways. So yeah, so that's also a reason, you know, it's part, it's one small reasons of many reasons why I also started on Twitch again. Um, that's why I also I have liveoverflow.com again. And um, why theoretically, if I weren't so lazy, I would also post stuff on Facebook and how can it be startup if he's coding it on stream? Isn't it open source then? Or at least public source? Uh, you know, just because you code it on stream doesn't mean that you publish your code uh, publicly. I mean, it's like, you know, kind of recorded, but it the, the license is not open source. So you don't have license to that code and you cannot take it and use it yourself or whatever. It didn't sound so complicated. Uh, have you ever written anything? Because once you build up something into a real product, there are so many small parts that you have to think about, like not only front end, the back end. You know, making, getting all these notifications from those different platforms, manage, uh, kind of distributing that for all the different creators on it, and yeah, I don't know. It feels like a lot of moving parts there. Just because it's open source doesn't mean it can Yeah, and that's also true. There are a lot of open source startups. If you do NOP as exchange ARX exists, then the high bits of ARX out of... Oh, really? Wow, okay. If you if we would have made a bet, like what is the behavior of exchange ARX on, on, on 64 bit, I would have bet probably like $100 saying that it would leave the higher bits alone. And thanks for testing. That's really cool that you uh, try to uh, test that and report back. Uh, what's the progress? Are you near the end? Uh, I'm not so sure. I mean, we are on video number, do I have to play this? We are on video number 25 right now and there are 44 videos in this series. But, uh, how much that results in actual like time and all those things considered I, I don't know I don't know I don't know the full series right like I'm working through this with you I feel like we are pretty far the modules that are only missing are basically just the program counter the thing that increments and like handles maybe jumps or so and then the 
the output register and the instruction decoder. Ah, so it's still quite a few modules. Maybe half, I guess. Almost half, or a bit over half, maybe. Does GitHub Enterprise give you the sources? Isn't GitHub Enterprise obfuscated? They could just give you a deployed like binary, basically. The worst thing about Reddit is is kind of this culture around self promotion that they are heavily against self promotion. I find that terrible. But I guess that's what the platform is built upon: sharing stuff, not making your own stuff. It's encrypted Ruby. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, if they give you this thing on premise, basically, they have to give you their sources somehow, and it's, I guess, encrypted or obfuscated. Uh, as far as I know, it's not just a simple encryption key, right? Like that, I haven't heard about that, but I mean, it's still kind of like reversible or deep, like kind of understandable. <laughs> yeah, there are always buses uh, driving in th on the street, and that's also my problem when I make when I record audio for videos. They drive every few minutes, so I constantly have to pause and redo again parts because they are just even with closed window you hear it. In some videos, you see some comments where people are writing that. Oh, what is that deep kind of like humming noise or so? Those are the buses outside. This is when I forgot or didn't pay attention or so. Or didn't care. Sometimes I'm also just lazy and I'm so mad at it. And so angry that I just, uh, fuck it. Sometimes I'm thinking, ah, uh, maybe I should use move in a different place where there's like less noise like this. Or where... Here the problem is I have a huge window front, so I can't really soundproof it. I mean, I have already the curtain in front of it, but that doesn't really help. So, uh, so sometimes I'm thinking, ah, maybe I should move in a different place. However, so far the neighbors have not even once complained, and that is good because I often up until late into the night and I might be streaming late at night. I might be recording videos late in the night and never have they said anything. And that is incredibly valuable because we hear their baby crying all the time from downstairs, which means they must hear, <coughs> oh, it must hear me. What's your problem, buddy? Go check it out. <sighs> Looks pretty good. Looks pretty good. Oh, I had the wrong screen on all the time. I'm sorry. Uh, I don't need the headphones for noise cancellation. I don't. It's not that noisy. I don't really care. It's the problem for recording. The problem is the microphone. So, the core functionality is crawling a bunch of APIs, saying the data push API. I can cobble together a similar Python script in a day. Yes, but that is very different from then having to scale that up to dozens, hundreds, maybe thousands of creators you need to constantly do. And it will not be a simple uh, crawler because you don't want to constantly ask if there's new stuff. You want to use a different protocol, but you want to be notified by uh, Apple and Android, uh, by Apple and uh, Google if new uh, uploads and so forth have come in. So you need to have a completely different model. You need to keep all these connections open uh, to to listen to incoming stuff. You need to, uh, because like a pub subscribe thing, you need to uh, have sensible recovery. What if the, your connection breaks? What if like the service has an outage? Um, faulty data coming back. You need to handle all of that. Your sim simple script, you don't care about it. If that breaks, you just restart it or so. But for well, proper setup, you need to think of all the different cases that could go wrong. Um, but the difference between a simple hacky script and a full product platform is miles of difference. And look at that design. It looks like professional. Like. This looks like a stereotypical website. It looks amazing. <laughs> the A register, the B register, and the instruction register. Okay, uh, I guess it's quickly also uh, verify that this works. It's a bit tedious with all the wires. 
I'm getting so tired. I'm I, I almost fell asleep there. I'm kind of sad that life also kept the magic smoke from escaping so far. I agree. I feel like some smoke would have made this a lot more exciting. Not even an exploding capacitor so far. Okay, so now everything should be connected except, ah, uh, wait, ah, uh, I need to put this the other way around. You should take this over here. The clock was also missing here because we need to connect to the bus. Let's enable that, I guess. But we just need to make sure that the output here is disabled. Okay, let's turn it on. Oh. Okay. Okay, yeah, that seems to work. So, so th this circuit here is constantly doing that, you know, that subtraction and so forth. Uh, and you can see that here nicely. And this is configured to read from the bus, so it keeps reading with each clock cycle that value in. And so these two registers should basically always be the same. So I'm just observing this now if this is counting correctly. There's something glitchy about it, no? Was it always delayed by one? No, okay, so now it's, there was something very glitchy about it. It didn't always work. See? Oh, no, 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 wait, I'm gonna, no, wait. Well, okay, slow the clock speed down. Yeah, I mean, first of all, it should still work at that clock speed. I mean, that was like super slow for what this should be able to do. But even now by hand, see, it's kind of glitching. Um, both these registers are configured to read from the bus. So it's kind of interesting that this bus gets out of sync so much. Did this just glitch? Is this what glitches? Okay, to be fair, maybe that has always been glitchy. I've never looked at it so hard because the thing is, yeah, it might, wait. Yeah, that could also be a thing that there's just the voltage levels are kind of getting to weird levels where um, it's just kind of glitchy. It could also be. 0,4 volt. Something is wrong. So if I measure up here, the voltage level over here is 3. Point, uh, wait, sorry. Like over here, it's 3.8. Okay, I think it's just voltage glitchy. kind of far away that connection let's see if I if we plug that oops short circuit if we plug it in here now we have a higher voltage level here now it also draws more current than just before I, I guess some stuff hasn't working and properly like some gates might not have kind of like worked because it draws now 0 0.2 amperes more than it was when I had it power plugged in somewhere else so I guess like some stuff was just not really working but it seems I have to solve it right it looks now pretty pretty good yeah I think that's that's okay yeah, but what if if I just keep the clock high like this, you know, it's just like I'm measuring now the voltage that this thing is outputting. It's like basically the LED is on like constantly up there, the blue LED. So if I measure, but yeah, I mean, if I keep that pressed, that's basically what I've been doing. I pressed that consistently and measured uh, basically what the output of that is. But yeah, it, it looks fine now, I guess. Like, I think it was really just like the voltage levels getting kind of low. The clock was probably not also had weird voltage level. Yeah, I think that's why it got glitchy. We really soon have to properly connect here power rails. Like these are not good enough. 
By the way, do you also think that my wiring has gone better over here? This looks, I feel like, way cleaner than this build, the, the original build here. Jumper wires are bad for power. Yeah, I know. By the way, people who haven't been here, did you see our new um, clock speed uh, selector up here in the corner? The potentiometer that we are using now? It's a wheel. Do you have capacitors on the board on the right? Uh, n no, I don't think so. Are you getting voltage drops along the power distribution? Yeah, that's what I believe what happened. Now it's just now it's fine. We moved it further into the middle between both modules, and now it seems okay for now. But yeah, it's generally a problem that we need to improve. I saw on another build, basically somebody uh, used like a bit thicker wire than what we have here, thicker wire than this, and then he just made a long line al around and soldered connectors to that wires because solder connections are like perfect. So so that power distribution was perfect, and then only it was going into the single rails of the p of the breadboards, and so that should be it's kind of the best way how to do it. And so I want to do that also soon, TM. I don't know. I, I guess I, I might do this as soon as we kind of like have everything f further in place, uh, like proper, like the bus setup, and we know where this goes, and then we can, you know, measure this properly. Anyway, okay, I'm getting super tired. We did make some good progress. Uh, I definitely need to uh, go now. Um, yeah, thanks so much for hanging out with me again. Today was a bit slower and more tired, but I guess tomorrow I should be back on speed uh, now that I have basically adjusted again to my sleep schedule now. I guess let's uh, host Jamie and then uh, we see each other. Uh, we see each other like tomorrow. Nice to see you on Twitch. Well, was a short meeting. Uh, see you hopefully soon another time. Uh, bye bye and say greetings to Jamie.